Well, our last message was, was spent, you know, the first part, I guess we spent tying up some of the loose ends of chapter 4, and which really, as I thought upon that, could easily have uh, followed up in another message, but I didn't want to belabor that too much. Uh, in fact, I didn't even touch on the fact that uh, what becomes abundantly clear in, in the end of chapter 4, I mean, I, I think it's been abundantly clear in other places in Galatians, but certainly at the end of 4, is that these verses uh, speak very much to the fact that there's no salvation specifically given to, to ethnic Israel for just being a Jew. This Hagar Sarah illustration completely destroys any notion that the Jews are saved simply by being ethnic Jews. And I didn't get into that really because Jeff's covered that in his time through Romans in his time with Romans chapters nine through eleven. But it is worth noting again because amazingly as clear as this is taught in Scripture, I mean this isn't just in Galatians. We still have professing Christians today treating Jewish people as if they're somehow receiving special treatment by God because of their Jewishness. We do. Unbelieving Jews, Paul makes it pretty clear, are in the bondage of Hagar. And they need to be set free. And the only way they will be set free is not by their adherence to Torah, but by coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Well, we did move here into chapter 5, verse 1, which we will permanently be in now. Primarily just looking at the first part of this verse. For freedom, Christ has set us free. It was for freedom's sake that Christ set us free. Freedom from the law, freedom from guilt, freedom from sin, freedom from death, freedom from the devil. To quote the Presbyterian Ryan or, or uh, Philip Ryken, rather, he has kept the law I could not keep, paid the penalty I could not pay, and won the victory I could not win. Therefore, and he quotes, the law of the Spirit of life has set me free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Romans 8 2. Free. Freedom in Jesus Christ. And so I ask you today, are you free? Are you free? Paul's very dogmatic in this claim throughout his letter that it's Christ or. It's not Christ and. It's Christ or Torah. It's, it's not Christ and Torah. That's what this letter screams. It, it jumps right off the page. And, and please, please hear what I'm saying when I say that. Don't, don't hear what I'm not saying. <laughs> Better yet, hear what Paul's saying. Don't, don't hear what Paul's not saying. He, he's not saying the law is bad. I'm not saying the law is bad. Not at all. The law is holy. The commandment is holy and righteous and good. Absolutely true. That's why it condemns us. Because we're not. I agree with the law that it is good. I do. And we should ever uphold it as such. It affirms the righteous standard of God of which we all fall short. And it points us to the only One who could and did satisfy its demands. But in coming to Christ, Paul says, in Romans 7, 6, now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that now we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not the old way of the written code. And we're making our way towards further instruction on this in chapter 5. Yes, of course. Of course, there are good, permanent, made in the image of God laws, commandments, principles that God requires all humanity to sub subject themselves to. God didn't create man to murder man. Didn't do it. He didn't create marriage to promote promiscuity. Not at all. Never, ever. God is a God of truth, did not create us so we could run around telling lies. No, it's never been permissible. It's always been sin. 
He didn't create us to, so we could go and serve and yield ourselves, to yield our allegiance to some other created being or thing. No, that's idolatry. That's sin. That's always wrong. It always has been wrong. To every one of us of all time, ever since the garden, ever since creation, God reinfor- and God reinforces these sins multiple times in Scripture. Multiple times. Not just one time in a set of tablets in a covenant made with a nation. That, I mean, that should really go without saying. But you see, Paul's concern is centered on the shadow of Moses. Which instead of being absorbed and fulfilled in the substance of Jesus Christ for which it existed, it was being held onto as the substance it was never intended to be. To quote Brian Borgman, a 1689 covenant theologian, in Paul's theology, he says, being under the law and being under sin is the same thing. And if you're not already convinced of that, I hope you will be by the time we get done with this letter. You see, one of the problems when you preach through Galatians or even Romans for that matter, a book like this, someone is invariably going to say the very same thing that people said to Paul. You're you're making grace out to be something far more better than it should be. You're speaking a way about Moses. You're making us lawless people, Paul. You're, Paul, you're promoting sin. I mean, how dare you take Torah away from, from the people of God, Paul? Should we all just sin? And since we're not under law but under grace, should we just sin? Spurgeon says, you have not preached the Gospel until or unless you've been accused of that. <laughs> I love that man. Can't wait to see him in his big bushy face. We, we, brethren, we have such a hard time. I mean, kind of going back to Mike's message, we have such we have a hard here. We're Christians. We love the God. We just sang about the gospel. We have, we have a hard time really grasping it, really believing the depths of its reality in our lives in a way that sets us free to be bold, right? That's that's one way. We have a hard time really believing in the freedom and power of God's grace given to us. We do. Freedom. This is really the climax, the clarion call of Paul's whole message here. Freedom from Jesus plus. Yes, freedom from, from Jesus plus the law, but really freedom from Jesus plus anything, period. Christian, are are you free? Are you free? Are you free from acceptance through obedience? Oh. I think that really hits us. I think some of you need to hear that. I'm I'm thoroughly convinced that's a far greater problem than folks tend to think it is. And I'm talking about with Christians, not with unbelievers. Not with professors of faith that don't have Christ. It's amazing how Christians can speak confidently of Ephesians 2.8. Know it. Memorize it. Hang it on the wall. Oh, yeah, you know, by grace I'm saved through faith. It's not my own doing. It's a gift of God that I've received. It's not by my works at all that I can boast in. And, and, and they can be theologically convinced that Jesus paid it all. And, and He bore my sins on His body on that tree and, and, and bore the penalty for me. So I, I stand justified before God on the, on the sole basis of Jesus' atoning work and that God loves me because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. But then, essentially, they betray that by questioning God's love for them or, or how much God loves them. Because, you see, just not quite performing like I think I need to perform or I want to perform or I, I don't feel it in the right kind of way. I f- feel like I need to feel it. You know, or I, I had it one time, this one feeling, now it's gone. It's, I, I kind of lost that loving feeling. Or something's, something's just not quite right. This doesn't seem right. I, I, and so their assurance meter runs low because their achievement meter says Failure. You know, one side of their mouth 
is saying, Jesus is my only hope. But then they get crippled by their performance evaluation. And joy becomes this little flickering flame, if a flame at all. You see the problem with that? What does that really end up meaning? Their full assurance is not in the finished work of Christ, but in Christ plus. They're looking for their joy or acceptance in their self-performance. Not in Jesus. It's really the same problem that was happening with these Galatian churches and at Rome and at Colossae. And performance-driven validation. Not cross-work validation. Oh, yeah, I need to do this. Or I, 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 I... not do that or follow this or you know if I can just keep this set of rules in order for me it's going to make me more complete I need to in order for me to kind of stay in the in the saving favor of God yeah Jesus got me in the door I'm good I'm justified but really I I really feel like I've got to keep this thing or do this I got to go I, I got to in order to stay under his saving favor you see if I don't I'm going to fall out of it You know what's wonderful about the new covenant? (laughs) God writes the rules He wants you to follow on your heart. He does. Which is fulfilled in the quote I just mentioned. Not, Not in the old ways of the written code, but in the new way of the Spirit. Which enables us to fulfill God's law by faith working through love, which we're going to get into in verse 6. Not today. Oh yes, if your life is a complete mess and you're living in sin, your life is just in bondage to iniquity and sin and wickedness, then you have every reason to question your freedom because you're not free. You're enslaved. That's not freedom. But I know there are those of you here who are perfectionists at heart, have legalistic tendencies or sensitive consciences and You can relate to what I'm saying here. Such people really tend to struggle entering into the fullness of freedom that grace provides them. Their joy can be hindered by all manner of things they don't feel like they're measuring up to or or an accusing conscience because of actual sin they did commit. That ever happened to you? Now, yes, God gave us a conscience. He did. A conscience we're not to ignore. It's a gift from God to keep us from evil. We're called as Christians to maintain a clear conscience before God and men. However, your conscience is not a flawless guide. It's not. Some of you might recall the old, some of the old timers might recall the old Jiminy Cricket song uh, jingle there. Always let your conscience be your guide. Uh, for the most part, that's not, a, that's not bad advice. But if there's a bad part about that statement, it's the word always. Because our consciences are capable of producing false guilt. And we have an enemy who's constantly seeking to accuse Christians before the throne of God and in our own mind and to one another. And all, all manner of evil he's working constantly, trying to keep, I mean, he's working overtime trying to keep guilt a fresh thing in your mind, Christian, in the minds of God's people, ever suggesting to you, you're not really free. You know what you've done. You got this, 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 this in your life. You did that, 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 that. You're not free. But when it comes to Christians who have repented of their sin and are trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ, their guilt is canceled in the wrath-absorbing blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what the sin was, how many times it was, if it's been repeated, real repentance equals real freedom. And most of us here, 
I think if we're honest, have a natural tendency to, to balk at that. Wait. I mean, there's got, there's got to be more. To, I mean, there's got, there's got to be some kind of penalty here. I mean, I've got, to, I've got to suffer something for this sin that I've done, for this thought that I had, for this action, for this outburst, for this, I mean, which, you know, it's easily this shifts into a mindset of penance. Some self-affliction i got to lay upon myself before I feel like I'm back again in good terms with God. Some kind, of a, some kind of way of punishing myself. Real difficulty grasping grace. Listen, once a sin has been properly dealt with before the Lord in confession and repentance, regardless of what your conscience or the devil might declare, you are a guilt free child of God. And you got to believe that, Christian. Your father is not hanging that thing over your head. He's not, he's not recording your sins in some uh, demerit book that he has in his back pocket that he's going to surprise you with on the last day and open it up and say, well, you know, I was keeping track of those things. Uh, no, not at all. Free and clear. That's, that's the record if you're in Christ. Free and clear. And brethren, that right there is the motivating force and power behind obedience to Christ. Not a list of rules. Not duty. It's in the realization of how free the freedom is that we've been granted. That's the power. If we can get a hold of it. If we can really see it. If we can really believe it. The extent to which you really believe that is the extent to which you're truly freed up to serve God for His glory. And listen, that is far easier to say yes and amen to than it is to truly process and anchor your soul into. I want you to notice the text here. Paul goes from freedom to stand firm. He goes from the indicative of what Christ has done Christ has set us free. We are free because Jesus has made us free. He goes from the indicative to an imperative or a command. From a fact that grace produces freedom to a command that really freedom produces, standing firm. From what Christ has done to what we are to do. Okay, attention all law lovers. Here's your due. Here it is. Here's your command. We're being commanded by the Apostle here to stand firm. But it's a command that's rooted in and motivated by the indicative reality that Jesus Christ has set us free. And this reality is really what all New Covenant commands flow from. Freedom, our our gratitude. Gratitude is what drives God's people to serve God. Gratitude is what drives God's people to bear fruit for His name. Gratitude is what drives God's people to be pleasers and lovers and pursuers of Jesus Christ. They're not motivated by duty, but by thankful hearts moved by the wondrous reality of what my freedom cost. And the desire to please Him who purchased me with His very own blood. Stand firm, therefore, Paul says. And it means just what it sounds like it means. To not give any ground. To keep one's standing. To to persist and persevere. To maintain allegiance to, in this case, to your own freedom. You know, Paul likes to use this term. He uses it multiple times. Stand firm. In 1 Corinthians 16, 13, he says, Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. In Philippians 1, 27, he says, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the Gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with your mind, striving side by side for the faith of the Gospel. Philippians 4.1 Therefore, my brothers whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 3.8 
For now we live. If you are standing firm in the Lord, it's fast there, same word. Standing firm in the Lord. You hear what, you hear the, the connection Paul makes in all those? What, what Paul connects to standing firm in? It's either in the faith or in the Lord. Which essentially is the same thing. Because the faith is in the Lord, and which is, which is the very thing that yields freedom to Christians. But as I clearly stated in my last message, this law-free gospel is not one that sets us free to commit sin. Not at all. That's never in the mind of the Apostle Paul. Never. Being under law, not being under law, but being under grace, which is a New Testament biblical statement and reality. But that reality is not heralded by Paul as a license for sin. In fact, grace frees you from sin. It doesn't lead you into it. It leads you away from it. And out of it. And then he, Paul says, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. I trust you're all familiar with what a yoke is. It's not that yellow part of the egg. That's a... <laughs> that's, that's a Y-O-L-K. Although that, that is a good part of the egg. A, a yoke was a tool that was made for, to help animals work together to bear heavy loads, doing heavy work, which basically was a, a wooden beam that laid on the shoulders of two oxen or whatever animal it was had a collar on each animal. It kept them aligned and in sync with one another. And enabled them to do twice the work. Enabled them to do more work. And then you came along, you had, you had human yokes too. Or you'd have the same kind of beam and you'd have these attachments out on the end where you could hold large items or heavy items that would be too awkward to carry with your hands. I mean, those have been used in the past. And of course, this transferred into human slavery as well. Yokes being used to constrain, to control, and in most cases, abuse people. Since Israel's bondage to Egypt, it became a metaphor for, for that which was burdensome. I mean, certainly the image is still in the oxen too. Burdensome, oppressive. Paul is referring to the law here as a yoke of slavery. No question in the context. Paul, Paul's not only the only apostle who does this though. Acts 15, if you want to put your finger here and just flip over to 15. You remember we looked at this before in Acts 15. Peter speaks of the Mosaic Law in very, very same fashion. When, when discussing this question, what, what should the, now what should the Gentiles be observing in terms of the, of the Mosaic Law? And the, and the primary issue on the table was with circumcision, but it was... The Mosaic Law. It produced this giant council at Jerusalem and all the apostles gather, all the, the big wigs of the, of the New Testament era. and Here they are. They're gathered. Verse 5. But some believers who belong to the party... Interesting. Luke calls them believers. Chew on that for a bit. So... Some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it's necessary to circumcise them and, and to order them to keep the law of Moses. Now, no if, or ands, or buts about it. This is the issue at hand, the law of Moses. Peter stands up and says in the middle of verse 7, Brothers, <laughs> you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as He did to us. And He made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ just as they will. Peter's saying, 
Don't you be laying this yoke of the law upon these Gentile believers. Don't do it. And as I've been saying, as I've said, and I'll say it again, if there was ever a moment in the place, if if there was ever a moment in New Testament Scripture, in the history of the church, early church, to highlight, underscore, affirm, or teach us about an old covenant, the old covenant sign of circumcision. That's what's on the table here. The old covenant sign of circumcision now being transferred into the new covenant as a sign for baptizing babies. This was the shining moment. But what do we have? Silence. And as our old dear. Brother R.C. Sproul would say, but it's a deafening silence. (laughs) I don't know, but I don't want to build my my theology on silence. I'm trying not to do that. Love that brother. We are very much indebted to him in a lot of ways. But I trust he knows better now. Anyway, then James gives us his judgment on what the Gentiles should observe and refrain from and as, as, as Christians in the midst of believing Jews. How, how are they to function? How do we deal with this? We're in the midst of Jews. And, and James' determination is he doesn't laden them with the yoke of Moses, but with four simple restrictions. In verse 20, Abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. Now, yes, they certainly received other instruction from Paul, but where their lives intersected Jews and Jewish custom built upon Old Covenant law, these were the only areas the apostles felt it was important to point out. And that's pretty significant. But back to... Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Paul says, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. He says, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Clearly, yes, I pointed out this is text is talking about the law, but, but notice the adverb again. Most of these folks, certainly not all of them, but most of these folks had, had, had never been under the yoke of the law. The law of Moses, for the most part, was foreign to them prior to their conversion. They, they didn't know of that. And saying again, Paul is, is re- referencing their former enslavement back there in, in chapter 4, verse 9. The worthless elementary principles of the world. Their, their former paganism. Their former pagan idolatry. That slavery that they were in. That's what these Galatians were previously yoked to prior to Jesus Christ saving them. And Paul's suggesting here that if you, to go from your pagan idolatry to Christ and then to the law of Moses would be to go from a yoke of slavery to freedom to a yoke of slavery. That's what he's saying. Stand firm, therefore, and do not yield. Don't return again to slavery this time being the slavery of Torah observance. Don't give place to that which is going to remove or threaten your freedom in Jesus Christ. And you know what's scary about this? They, they didn't believe, they didn't think they were, what they were doing was enslavement at all. They thought assuming old Jewish covenant signs and, and their lifestyle was actually a super spiritual benefit. I mean, they were growing, maturing advancing as Christians. This is making them more Christian now. I mean, look at us. Now we're really committed. We're, I mean, we're just like the other Jewish believers. And yes, that specific scenario is, would not find, we wouldn't find ourselves tripping over such things, trying to be Jewish today. At least I hope not. I don't think that's anybody's struggle here. But, but the root issue is not really much different we can easily become ensnared by subjecting ourselves to to the enslavement of seeking completeness in something other than Christ Himself. 
Instead of really finding our completeness and satisfaction in the all-satisfying person and work of Jesus Christ, we can fall prey to this notion that I need this, I need that, and, and boy, if I get it, I will reach the heavenlies. I will be the, I'll be on the spiritual high plane. I'll really be growing. If I can, if I can just keep up with my McShane Bible reading, and, and then, that, then I'll be a little bit more complete. Or if I, can just, if I can just get this next book on this subject, that, that's going to make me more complete. Or hear this series, sermon series, or, or talk to this preacher, or take this course, or go to this event, or you know, establish this discipline in my life. That's going to make me more Christian. That's going to make me more a true Jew. And that's really, brethren, just a very subtle form of enslavement. And you may not think that, but your inability to find true rest and peace in the person of Christ suggests that very thing. Now, we'll never say this verbatim, but here's the issue at hand. This is, this is the mindset. This Gospel of grace, as I said, it's just... It's, it's, it can't be that simple. It's, it, it can't be that gratuitous. It can't, I mean, how can it be? I mean, I, I, I've got to give some kind of contribution. I've got to give something back. I've got, to, I've got to prove my worthiness of this grace. It, it can't be some small potatoes kind of effort or response on my part. I mean, that just won't satisfy I me. Mean, we're talking about the living God here. I've got to produce something that's God-worthy in my life. And brethren, that underlying motivation is nothing short of slavish fear, if not just unbelief. Not gospel gratitude. If your service to God doesn't flow out of love and thanksgiving and gratitude for the God of glory who stooped down in your wretched mess and lifted you out solely on the basis of His mercy and kindness towards you, then you're not seeing the gospel properly. And you're being yoked up to that which is no different than these Galatians. Christians can get entrapped into slavish ways of thinking and serving God. As I alluded to earlier, this performance-driven validation because they have such a hard time grasping and resting in the promise of grace in the Gospel. That through Christ, I'm 100% set free from the claims of the law, the demands of the law, the guilt of the law, the curse of the law, the judgment of the law, the jurisdiction of the law. I'm dead to it. Dead. The penalty and power of sin, broken. The wrath of God completely removed from me. Not based on anything I did or I do, but solely, wholly, completely, thoroughly through Jesus and Jesus alone. That's the Gospel. That is the Gospel. Believe it. Live in light of it. That, my friends, is fuel for service for God. Right there. Cross work validation. That must be this, the Christian soul confidence. And when it is, I mean, there's nothing freer. I mean, if there was a, if there was a freer word to use than freedom, I'd use it. But, there, but there's not. I can't think of one anyway. But we're free. Free, brethren. Let's resist. Let's stand firm against any notion or whisper or suggestion that you need something other than Jesus Christ's merits to make you acceptable or improve or preserve your stat status before God. This post-justification status affirmation, that must be rooted in the cross and nothing in you. Not this thought that you know, God's joined me to His Son by faith. I believe that. But, but now I've got to somehow prove myself. Or, or further secure my standing before Him by how well I perform. That's not the Gospel. In fact, that's bad news. It's not good news for men. Now, I am not denying that true Christians bear true Christian fruit not denying that at all, or the fruit of the Spirit. In fact, that's the very thing where Paul's headed. 
The the mark of true Christianity is not law-keeping, but the evidence of the Holy Spirit bearing fruit in the lives of Christians. Yes, Christians show their faith by how they live their lives, but I'm not chopping down that tree here. I'm going after this tree that seeks its assurance and affirmation of its spiritual status by what it does rather than what Christ does or has done. The tree that says, oh yeah, oh Christ alone. (laughs) Uh, Absolutely. I'm saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Uh, But, uh, well, I mean, you see, I've got a blank. All right, yeah, I, I, I can't do do blank or, or my standing with God will change and that's really no different than what's being dealt with in this letter I'm afraid if the truth were to be told or known this, this thinking applies to a lot more people in this room than we'd suspect and that's why denominations like Pentecostals who believe you can lose your salvation, why they have people that are so riddled with having no assurance whatsoever and tend to be very legalistic people. Why do they struggle with assurance? Well, everything hinges on them. Hinges on whether or not they can perform, whether or not they can keep doing whatever it is, is that's necessary that can satisfy their own mind or conscience that's going to keep them in good standing with God. You see? It all hinges on them. Because after all, they can lose it. If you can lose it, it's, it's not God's salvation, it's yours. And that ain't no salvation at all. Those of you that are Christians, I want you to look down at this passage again. Chapter 5, verse 1. You see that word freedom there? That's the Holy Spirit's proclamation of you who have entrusted your life and never dying soul to Jesus Christ. Free. No strings attached. Free. Yeah, but... No yeah, buts. Free. Free. The the but should be but God. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love wherewith He loved us. Uh, Great love. Did you hear that? Great love. Great love came down and took hold of us. It's God's great love. God's not hesitant or embarrassed or reluctant to pronounce great love towards you. Yes, even you. This great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Yes, there was a day when you were absolutely dead in trespasses and sins, and you didn't care about sin. You didn't even, you didn't even acknowledge sin. You didn't even know what conviction was. You didn't, let alone, regret your wicked pursuits and lusts after sin. You didn't care about that at all. But God. But God made us alive together with Christ. And you know what happens when you're alive? You can feel, Right? When you're dead, you don't feel anything. But when you're alive, you start feeling something. You're made aware and sensitive to some realities without and some realities, especially the realities within. Realities of sin and evil and things that are opposed to God. Things that before the before time, before God came down and rescued you, you were completely dead to, completely numb to, completely ignorant of. You were dead. You were dead to it. But great love makes you see it, makes you know it, makes you feel it, makes you call it what it is. That's what it means to be alive. Alive doesn't mean you're completely absolved from sin. Alive means you recognize the sin. You turn from the sin and you run to the great rescuer and redeemer of your soul and you plead His blood and you plead His mercy and you plead His grace and you point to those wounds and you rejoice in them. Because there's your forgiveness. You know what you're met with when you, when you go there to that throne? You're not met with some angry cosmic Zeus who's ready to beat you over the head or strike you with some lightning because you, you, know, you failed again in this area or you had a bad thought or, or you didn't do your morning devotion. No, no, no. A thousand times no. Listen, it's great love. It's great love that came down and took upon Himself human form. It's great love that drove Christ to the cross. Not so He could berate you for your failures. 
<laughs> Not at all. He already knew those and knows every. He knows more of the failures than you know. He knows more about your failures than you know yourself. No, He came to save you from all those failures. This is who Jesus is. He's mighty to save from the uttermost to the guttermost. That's the Savior we have. And none are too bad for Him. I'm telling you, not one of them. A devil's lying to you if you think you're too bad to come to Christ. He came for such. He came for such people that are wretches, that have defiled Him, that have ignored Him, that have presumed upon Him. Lay down your weapons. Embrace Him today. And He says, come and you can have Me and you'll have everlasting life. That's the, that's the Christ of Scripture. Glorious Savior is Jesus my Lord. When you come, He sets you free. He sets you free. Freed from all things which you could not be freed by the law of Moses, He says. Freed from sin. Freed from self. Freed from darkness. Freed from this world. Free, yes, as our brother said, freed from death. Listen. Our next casket gets placed in this, in, in this front here. We're all going to be weeping and mourning. I got, I got news for you. The person that was in that body, they're up singing hallelujah, rejoicing. They're not dead. They're ever alive. They're more alive than all us weeping folks over here feeling sorry for ourselves because they're gone from us. That's the difference between a Christian funeral and one that's not. Oh, a massive difference. Our death is a gateway to the presence of Christ. Oh, what a glorious thing. Where am I at? <laughs> Brethren, we as Christians, we, we must stand firm in this Christ who purchased our freedom. And this is something to be worked up about. Our freedom! Don't let anything take your freedom away. In Christ. And there are a thousand other things outside of the law of Moses that, are, that, that threaten to take your freedom from you in this world. I'll protect it. There are things, there are people, there are ideas, there are philosophies that would seek to bring you into slavery. Just like Paul expressed, I mean, he expressed it there. We looked at that at chapter four, verse or chapter two, verse four, right? False brothers came in. Oh, they're slippery and they're secret, right? They, they came in secretly and they slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us what? Into slavery. Verse 5, to them we did not yield. We stood firm. We did not yield in submission even for a moment, Paul says. We must stand firm against anything that would seek to enslave us and thereby threaten our freedom. Stand firm against bad suggestions and bad thinking. Stand firm against the lies of the devil. Stand firm against unbiblical thinking. Against any attempt to turn our sanctification into our justification. It's huge. Stand firm. And you want to know the best way to stand firm? The best way. Marvel at this declaration of being free. Marvel at the freedom you had. The status of Jesus claiming us free. Marvel at the cross. Marvel at the risen one. Marvel at Him. That's how you stand. Complete in Thee. We sang it. Complete in Thee. No work of mine may take, dear Lord, the place of Thine. Thy blood hath pardoned Bought for me, and now I, I now I am complete in Thee, brother. Freedom. You're a free child of God. And he's going back to Mike's message, brother. We can't live the life that we're called to if we're entrapped, if we're enslaved, and it comes to the very basics of Christianity, Christ and what He's accomplished. Is that the basis of your confidence? Is it really? Because if, if you're convinced before a holy God that I, He sees me just as He sees His Son, that is liberating. Right? Oh God, liberate us. Help us. And I wanted to turn... I wanted to turn... Uh, I thought I had it written down here somewhere. To uh, let's go to Matthew chapter eleven. 
Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. We'll close with this. Because you know something strange? Is God brings us out of one kind of slavery and brings us into another. <laughs> In fact, actually, just real quick. We'll go to Rome. Put your finger there. Go to Romans 6 first. I want you to read this. This is the kind of this is true of all human beings. We're all actually really slaves. Romans 6. Verse, let's just jump in here. Well, Paul asks, that's where Paul asks the question, verse 15, what then? Are we to sin because we're not under the law but under grace? By no means, he says in verse 15. Verse 16, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin which leads to death or of obedience which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed and having been set free from sin have become slaves of righteousness. So God takes those who were once enslaved to sin and guess what? He makes you a slave to righteousness. But it's a, it's a completely different... See, the slave, slavery to sin is just that. A, 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 is is a oppressive and burdensome. The slavery to Jesus Christ comes from a heart that's willing, desirous of being connected to Christ. And that's where I want to go back to, to Matthew 11. The illustration He gives us here of, being, of our slavery to Jesus Christ, it's a whole different kind of slavery. Matthew 11 Verse 28, Come to Me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take, your yoke, take My yoke upon you and learn from Me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For My yoke is easy and My burden is light. Jesus says, take My yoke upon you and learn from Me. You know what happens when you're yoked up to Jesus? <laughs> he's, he's right there by your side. And you can look at Him. And you can watch Him. You can talk to Him. You can hear Him. And as you do, it makes you want to obey Him and love Him and serve Him and trust Him and follow, and follow His lead under that yoke. Because guess what? When you have, you have the being that has the strongest and broadest shoulders in the universe, it doesn't matter what kind of load's laid upon it, he ain't moving. His, he, his standing's firm, and that load's, guess what? It doesn't, all that load doesn't transfer to you, it transfers to him. And so, yeah, just like he says, wait a minute, giant loads? Yeah, you'll find rest to your soul. So Jesus is over here bearing all the load and weight, and we're over here just resting in the yoke, right? That's the image. It's just counterintuitive. But that's the reality. Christ bears the burden for us. Christ takes it upon His shoulders so it's not on yours. My yoke is easy. My burden's light. Oh, to Him it's light too. It's nothing to Him. The whole thing's light. So I encourage you, come to Christ. Oh, you got burdens you're weighing. I mean, there's things going on in your life that other people don't. You know. You know. And you know what? Christ says, come. I'll take it. You're not going to shock me. Trust me. I've dealt with the most wicked of people. There ain't nothing you've done I haven't handled before in the universe. It, 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 come. And you're going to find out that my yoke is far more favorable than Satan's. Far more. And I'll take all those things you've done against me as an enemy and I'll just wash them away. And you'll be gladly yoked to me. Father, we're so thankful for the Gospel. Lord, Lord, I think about that hymn went through my mind.
prone to wander, Lord, we feel it. Lord, take our yoke, double latch it, bolt it, tie it. Lord, don't let us out of Your yoke. Lord, we want to be near You. We want to hear You. We want to follow You, Lord. We want to trust You. We want to see more deeply, more, Lord, penetrate our minds and hearts with this glorious Gospel of Your grace that would truly set us free. Yes, Lord, free to be bold, free to be, Lord, Lord, to not be anchored down to this perishing world. Not to waste our time and our days. Lord, help us. Help us as Christians, Lord. Move us along. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.